Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. For, so today we're going to be talking about breaking bootloaders in mobile devices, not just the core Snapdragon chipset, but also the peripheral hardware that is around that uh, briefly. Um, before we start, a bit more about me. Um, I, my name is Christopher Wade. I am a security consultant at a pen testing firm called Pentest Partners because we like to be on the nose. And uh, I work there doing automotive, maritime, IoT and hardware testing. Um, so mobile bootloaders are in pretty much every aspect of how a smartphone works, from the core chip for the Snapdragon side to the Bluetooth modules, Wi-Fi, and my personal favorite, the NFC chips. Um, these all require their own firmware update mechanisms, usually for deployment of these firmware protocols. Um, and these all are usually rather custom and have interesting weaknesses. And by finding weaknesses in them, we can bypass their signature protections to modify their capabilities. So as I said, my personal favorite is um, NFC uh, controller bootloaders um, because most modern smartphones use NFC functionality in some capacity. Now this is driven by its own uh, chip, which in the modern day is usually a Cortex-M or secure core chip, so running ARM Thumb architecture. And these bootloaders always employ some kind of signing to um, prefer um, to enforce the uh, firmware protections in place. This is because the NFC manufacturers generally don't want users to be able to do things like emulate different NFC uh, standards which are not intended by the device. For instance, NXP have some licensing requirements around their MyFair Classic, My, My Fair Classic standard, which they don't want to be implemented directly. Um, so speaking of NX, um, NXP, my first um, vulnerability in a bootloader I want to talk about is in the firmware update mechanism they use in their NFC chips, which are found in pretty much every smartphone. There's a good few of them in the room right now, um, which uh, is used in iPhones, um, some Samsung devices, etc. Um, it's really pervasive and it's a really popular chipset to be in use. Now, this particular chipset uses a firmware uptake mechanism whereby it um, takes the last block of the firmware, hashes it, takes that hash and puts it at the end of the previous block of the firmware, hashes that all together and back all the way to the start. And then it assigns the original hash at the start. What this essentially does is create sort of a hash chain whereby you can't ever deploy code that isn't been verified at some part of that chain to the device. Uh, this means that you can't do things like write firmware that you'd want to then uh, jump into later through some kind of memory corruption. However, I found that by um, writing a large corrupted packet between the firmware updates, I could overwrite the SHA-256 hash that was stored in memory at that time and basically create my own chain of hashes halfway through a firmware update to completely bypass the signature protection. Additionally, uh, the Samsung S3 series of NFC controllers, which are found largely in Sam Samsung devices, but some others as well, um, it uses an update mechanism where it sends a hash and a signature of that hash to the chip right before sending the firmware update, which is then hashed and verified against the hash and the signature. I found that this protocol also sent the size of the hash and the signature at the same time, and by increasing that, I could overwrite the stack with it, allowing me to jump past the signature checks at the start of the bootloader and into the firmware I'd just written. Now, obviously, the attacking the bootloaders in the, uh, in the phone in that capacity would require you to have root access in some capacity or access to the uh, I2C bus on that. However, in having that access, you can essentially take a phone which has rudimentary NFC capabilities and turn it into a an attack tool. So for instance, um, features like the Proxmark uh, attack tool could be added to it. Uh, in my personal capacity, uh, my proof of concept for, the, for this was to implement the MyFair Classic standard so that I could uh, replicate my hotel doors for whenever I go to a hotel into my phone directly. But of course, this has minimal impact on end users. But as someone who works in pen testing and social engineering and physical security, it is quite useful. But um, obviously, we're at Qualcomm now, and they very kindly allow me to speak about my um, bootloader vulnerabilities that I found in both their primary and uh, late stage bootloaders. So primary, Qualcomm's primary bootloader has a USB interface called EDL, um, which is generally used for unbricking and management of devices in some capacity. This mode is entered um, due to unrecoverable boot errors. Um, by shorting pins on the board, or um, by uh, using a specialized cable in some ways, which shorts the um, data pins to ground on a USB cable, which then boots into that mode on reboot. The key purpose of this um, interface is essentially to load up what's um, generally called a loader image to the device. This is a signed image, which um, is loaded into RAM and then used to read and write partitions on the device and to do other management things. There is some public research on this by a company called um, ALF Security, um, which uh, researched some weaknesses in this loader mechanism and found that it had some capacity for peaking and poking memory, essentially reading and writing at bat. Um, 
However, there was no real research I could find publicly about the update mechanism used to deploy this. A uh, vulnerability in that particular part of the um, bootloader would be able to allow an attacker to comprise the entire secure boot, secure boot chain, essentially. So this user USB interface is user serial interface called Sahara, which is a binary protocol, which um, essentially is set up as a bit of a state machine back and forth for loading the ELFs. And when the loader is deployed, the loader facilitates usage of an XML-based interface for things like reading and writing memory or rebooting the device, et cetera. Um, what this requires is a loader which has been signed by the manufacturer and matching against the public keys stored within the device. So um, Sahara uh, functions by the phone requesting data back from the um, host PC, um, requesting parts of an ELF file for the loader device, to, uh, the loader firmware to run. Um, this allows for uh, some amount of signature enhanced verification where you have to um, get the ELF header and then the signature into the phone before you then load the other program, her um, program headers. Um, this can be implemented in a uh, simple while loop with a switch case, just for the different commands going on, including uh, checking for the initialization data of the device, reading memory back, and actually starting that process going through. Um, what I wanted to do with this is to enumerate some hidden functionality within the EDL mode. So publicly, there are a lot of tools that currently support the Sahara protocol for various purposes, mainly reverse engineered, but some from uh, other methodologies. Um, and these did not um, went all the way up to a command called OX12, which was the 64-bit read command. I wanted to see if OX13 was something undocumented that did something interesting. What you often find in bootloaders is there's management functionality that hasn't been documented, um, which can then be used by an attacker to obviously get themselves further. For instance, on the NFC chips I just mentioned, the Samsung NFC chip, at least the older versions, had a hidden command that allowed you to do arbitrary memory reads and writes from the chip to dump the bootloader without having to do any other exploitation. But I found that the OX13 command um, actually just reset the state machine of the loader process, meaning that I could essentially restart the entire process back again. This, this was very useful because the EDL mode is um, very crashy. It doesn't like you to change the sequence um, too heavily as you go along and will cause you to have to reboot your phone to get to a known good state. Um, however, with this OX13 command, you could just send this across and restart the state machine. I found um, that this would be probably be very useful for some fuzzing because I could start attacking things like the elf headers and other commands. And if the setup crashed, I could just restart it again. However, I found that my test phone would crash after sending around 130 resets. The entire USB stack would crash and I would have to hold down my phone's power button for quite a long time to get back into that state. Um, so because it crashed in this capacity and there's such a um, strange um, a number of resets, I thought it was ever going to be some kind of buffer overflow or resource exhaustion of some kind uh, in the stack or heap or whatever. Unfortunately, because this is in the PBL, which is stored in ROM, I was pretty much doing everything side channel and only guessing about what I was doing at each stage of this process. Um, I found that uh, different features of the Sahara protocol broke at different, re these, uh, different resets amounts. For instance, if I sent 27 uh, resets and then try to perform the full update to load a loader, it wouldn't get verified and the setup would crash. However, if I sent 26, it would execute absolutely fine. And I um, went through all of my different Snapdragon chips I had available to verify this. Um, I identified this on multiple chips, including the STM665, 660, um, and 730. Um, because I could cause the signature verification process to fail, it meant there might be ways for me to make it pass without actually verifying the signatures. Um, Analysis of the um, Snapdragon chips I had uh, available, however, found that sent, modifying any data that I sent with the OX13 command didn't actually do anything. It just did exactly what I expected each time. I'd reset it and reset it, and it would crash in exactly the same way. However, I found that if I used the um, Sahara commands for reading back the public key hash and other memory IDs, I could um, overwrite these with memory being pushed into it via what I now presume to be a resource um, exhaustion vulnerability. Um, what you're seeing there is um, the data that comes back when you request a public key hash, but what you're meant to obviously be seeing is quite high entropy data, uh, you know, SHA-256 hashes. What you're actually seeing is some pointers from memory that have been shoved into that memory space. Um, in summary, of course, um, the overwriting of the signing keys could allow for bypass of the secure boot mechanism. However, because this was in the PBL and I had no access to this, it would require someone with quite intimate knowledge of that level of the boot chain in order to actually fully exploit this. While I did believe it would be possible to exploit this with access to a PBL or um, access to some debugging on a Snapdragon chip, um, it did uh, uh, not make it possible while I was doing this project. Um, 
I also found that the SDM765 found in some modern phones was not vulnerable to this chip, um, this vulnerability, and as such, I could probably use that for more targeted fuzzing later. Now, we've spoken about the um, primary bootloader, which is uh, a very uh, exciting, important part of the st um, st that boot stage. However, because it's in the um, boot ROM and it's not really accessible, it's not something you can target, um, a layman can really attack just outright. And what they were probably more likely to do is go for something a bit higher level and a bit more accessible to the user. So um, most uh, Android devices, especially Qualcomm Snapdragon's um, devices, contain a late stage bootloader um, called the Android bootloader stored in the ABL partition. This also supports a USB interface, which you can access generally by holding down the volume down button and power on your phone. And is used for things like device management to check different IDs, bootloader unlocks, etc. However, I found that some OEMs like to implement restrictions on this um, stage of the boot process in order to essentially restrict how much um, they uh, an attacker would be able to uh, use their phones and deploy unsigned firmware, etc. Uh, they essentially want to prevent people from unlocking their bootloaders too often or distributing devices with an unlocked bootloader. Um, so. I'm going to be honest, I started this project because I had a device which did have this limitation on it, and I didn't want to wait the seven days the manufacturer wanted to actually unlock my bootloader and start researching. Um, the device itself was a mid-range phone uh, released in 2017 and used a Snapdragon 660 chipset. Um, the bootloader could be gotten out of the, um, the memory partitions on the phone um, because they were in the uh, OTA updates, etc., and because I had an access to one of the EDL loaders uh, mentioned previously. Um, and I found that this bootloader had been modified to add this waiting period that I just mentioned. Um, essentially, they added a signature protection in place so that they had, you had to use their fast boot tool in order to actually unlock the bootloader by ver they verifying the signature sent across to it. Um, so there's a few reasons why people would want to implement these kind of um, unlock protections in place. The first one, of course, is that um, causing inexperienced users to deliberately weaken their phone security by someone saying, oh, do this, run this command, etc., and then deploy this image I gave you for whatever purpose, for instance, different translations or access to certain apps and functionality, um, is something that they don't necessarily want to happen. They want to make sure that it's protected in some capacity from someone who uh, is a bit, being a bit cavalier with their devices. Also, um, it prevents against some level of supply chain attacks. Now, obviously, um, during the boot process, if you have unlocked your bootloader, it tells you very succinctly that your phone is not protected and has got um, lots of uh, weaknesses that uh, could be exploited by an attacker. Um, however, this is something that's still possible for someone to ignore as they boot their phone. As such, um, it prevents people from loading the phone with malware without having to worry about signature protections before sell to a third party. Um, it also means that manufacturers are capable of, in some capacity, tracking who is unlocking their bootloaders. Multiple companies um, implement uh, authentication requiring a SIM card and logins to actually get you to that process. Um, so to attack Fastboot, I wanted to implement the uh, entire um, Fastboot protocol from scratch, and I found this to be a very simple thing. Um, it's got a lot of standard USB libraries and tools available. However, I found in previous work that whenever I use a USB library of this capacity, it would um, prevent you from doing uh, more complex things or things that they already know shouldn't be in scope. For instance, I found a fast boot library which restricted the size of commands that could be sent to the device via it and actually send it through an error back, which is something I didn't want to do if I was then going to start targeting fuzzing. The protocol itself is very simple. It uses the USB bulk endpoints back and forth um, and sends essentially ASCII commands back and forth. This is the USB equivalent of Telnet, essentially. You throw some data at it, you get some back. It's all human readable and you can see it. Um, what I wanted to do as I was looking through um, the bootloader itself was analyze it. And I extracted it from the ABL partition of my phone using the EDL mode. Now, it, what came back is an ELF file in this instance. However, it contained no executable code, but running binwalk on it found that it did contain a UEFI file system. This is a file system for storing other bits of data alongside the different ex executables that could be used for this process. There's publicly available tools available for this, such as UEFI firmware parser, um, which could be used to find a portable executable. Um, and these themselves can be loaded directly into IDA. And while it won't give you the correct memory offset for where the um, code is going to be, for instance, in this instance, uh, it should have been at OX9FA000, um, it would at least give me enough to work with to analyze how the code was running and any weaknesses I potentially found in it. 
Um, so I decided to look directly at how the bootloader had been modified slightly by this, by this manufacturer and found that they'd slightly modified the flash command. Now, this is a command used to flash the different partitions on the device, but only usually on bootloaders that have been unlocked for routing, etc. What I'd found is that the manufacturer had added a bit of a caveat here um, to allow you to flash to a specialized partition called the CRC list partition. Um, they were handled differently and went off their own um, code space in the, uh, in the firmware that I was looking at. Um, and I thought there would be some potential for either memory corruption or partition overwrites if I could find an implementation weakness in how they had done this. Um, because I was reverse engineering just by analyzing the um, USB packets back and forth and guessing about how this worked, because I wanted to keep myself with a bit of an open mind about how this process worked, I um, decided to also guess the command sequence for how this flash command worked. What's meant to happen is you send a download command with a payload size and then the payload itself, and then you tell the device to flash it to a specific partition. Essentially, you tell it how much data to take, you send that data, and then flash it. My command sequence was to tell it to flash the partition and then send 10 megabytes of data down to the buffer, which the device interpreted as a very large command. I'd also um, incorrectly left some code at the bottom of this implementation, which was another flash command. And after this had run, my phone crashed and the USB stack completely uh, stopped working. And this was obviously due to the fact that I didn't have a download command, switching it into the download mode. Um, I decided to analyze what happened with this crash and found that the USB connectivity of the device stopped functioning entirely. Um, I could unplug it, plug it back in again. I couldn't enumerate it anymore, but the phone also didn't reboot. Um, so by performing a hard reset using the volume down button and um, power for about 10 seconds, I could reboot the phone and try this again. I sent a much smaller payload of about um, 4,096 bytes and found that this didn't crash the phone, meaning that there was a potential for some kind of buffer over vulnerability directly in this process. I used a binary search approach um, where I took a large payload and a small payload and half the space between them and saw if it crashed until I found the exact size where the, uh, the firmware would crash during this process, which turned out to be OX11BAE0, which kind of confirmed to me that this was definitely going to be some kind of memory corruption I could potentially use in some capacity. Um, due to this unusual memory size, um, I thought it was going to be in the stack um, or some kind of RAM. Um, it could potentially be in the bootloader code itself, but I wasn't sure at this point. And as I had no debugging capability and I was just doing this out of bandwidth brute force, um, I'd have to identify what memory was being overwritten by a brute force approach, essentially. Um, I also found that the bootloader itself used some quite robust stack canaries um, in all functions that are running through, meaning that if I had hit a stack overflow in some capacity, this wouldn't really be usable unless the random, random number generator for the um, stack canary hadn't been implemented appropriately. Um, I manually verified the next byte of the sequence from 11BAE1 um, uh, by sending uh, a huge amount of data each time. So send the huge data and that's changing the last byte, starting from 00 all the way up to FF. As you can imagine, rebooting my phone 255 times was quite time consuming. Um, as I wanted to automate this process so that I could get a buffer in place, I decided to uh, automate it by modifying my um, code to do it constantly by forcing a reboot. My colleague suggested to me that I should use a, um, a USB relay and take the battery out of my phone. However, the phone I was using had a lot of glue inside, meaning that I'd have to take that off, potentially damage the phone, damage the screen, and remove the battery. I found a more rudimentary approach was to take a hair tie and wrap it around the volume down and power buttons for my phone. Um, <laughs> My wife graciously gave me that, which was nice. <laughs> and um, this caused the device to go into essentially a boot loop where it would restart, go into fast boot mode, and then load up the USB stack, but also get prepared to then reboot again while that process was running. This gave me enough time to verify this buffer overflow in the next stage of it, while it then being allowed to automate itself back and forth again. Um, what I wanted to do is essentially get as close a facsimile of the data that I was looking for as possible. And what I did is make the, this check verify two things. The first is to, um, was to check that the um, chip had a flashing failed response um, back from the, uh, from the phone. So when I sent the flash command, it'd say flashing failed because there was no permissions to do it. And then you would continue usually. Um, I also want to check if the phone crashed afterwards after this process. Essentially, this would mean I'd have two things to check on, which I could then verify over the multiple reboots that I took on. And each iteration of this took 10 to 30 seconds, depending on if the USB stack happened to want to restart after holding down the power buttons or so on. Um, 
I left my phone overnight performing this. Um, this whole project took around um, three days of time between uh, other projects, but it was quite a fun, interesting one that kept me going. But I left it overnight and found that after about eight hours, I had generated 34 bytes of um, what I was pretty sure was shellcode or um, ARM64 freehands at the time. Um, what this meant was firstly that I hadn't hit a stack canary, which I was very happy about, and meant that I had in fact got a potentially exploitable um, buffer over fleekness I could work with. All of the 32 bits words came up to what looked like fairly succinct and fairly workable um, uh, ARM64 operations. You can see um, a stack management command at the start, you can see some branch and links and some addressing, etc., meaning that this was probably close to what was actually being stored in the memory that I was working with, but it wasn't exactly right. Um, there's a few reasons for this. The first is that ARM64, as a um, uh, uh, architecture, can have some unused bits flipped within certain commands that don't really affect anything, but could potentially in some capacity. But because I was brute forcing this process, I probably wouldn't hit anything like that. Also, registers can be accessed in both a 32-bit and 64-bit capacity. And depending on how the compiler is handling these, it can either affect everything about how everything's working or not affect anything whatsoever. Um, also, branch instructions in ARM64 can have conditions for jumping to different function calls, etc. And because of this, um, you, uh, you could have in, uh, iterations where I had found a branch instruction that was verifying, for instance, if there was a zero set before jumping, but the register was checking would always be zero no matter what in this stage of the process. Um, because of this, the, the um, code that I generated could be superficially um, different to what I had, even if it did at least get the uh, code going, at least in the short term. Um, I decided to use the branch and link instruction that I found in this process because it was less likely to be um, something that was going to be modified. Because the branch and link would have to jump to, for instance, a printf or something, it would have to handle the stack appropriately and process the data appropriately. And so what I decided to do was perform a regex search within my um, IDA instance to search for this operation while removing different nibbles from the opcode to see if I could find data that was similar. Um, I found a few different ones, but what I found was that there was a branch and link that was almost exactly right, apart from the first nibble, um, which had similar code to what I generated above it. So as you can see, there's stack handling in the right place, um, and then there's addressing in the right place, etc. I mean, this is probably where I was jumping into. Um, this was actually in the CRC list parser, which I was talking about earlier, meaning that I had hit the code that I was intending to, but also implied that the buffer overflow I'd found was not actually incidental because of this additional partition, but was core to the bootloader in use. Um, so to unlock the bootloader with this uh, particular buffer overflow vulnerability, what I'd need to do is essentially jump into the bootloader, un bootloader unlock code I was working with. And what I decided to do was overwrite the code that was there with itself. So I was a buffer overflowing the bootloader. I had a copy of the bootloader. So if I overwrote it with itself, then nothing else would break, but I could make minor tweaks to do whatever I wanted with this process. And all I did was create a branch and link instruction into um, one of the other branch and links that are around in the firmware and jump directly into the bootloader unlock um, and get it going. Now, this process would be, of course, be difficult to debug because I did not have any debugging going on, no JTAG, no UART, nothing, but it'd be easy to identify because my phone would reboot and then probably tell me that all my partitions were corrupted. Um, while routing the phone in this capacity was excellent, um, it would uh, and would allow me to deploy custom recovery images. It didn't really have anything that would be workable from a um, security capacity. Unlocking your bootloader is something we all do for research, and it's not something that is really a vulnerability in that sense, but it was interesting. Now, Qualcomm Snapdragon chips, they um, can encrypt the user, to the user data partition on um, locked bootloaders to prevent, obviously, attacks against um, code execution in the bootloader from getting access to user data, as mentioned by the previous speakers today. Um, while I could do things like dump some RAM um, to do a bit of a cold boot attack via this attack, that wasn't really workable either, just from the position in memory that I was working with. Um, and also, I found that attempting to replicate this vulnerability on other newer phones, such as the SDM665, were not effective at all. Um, what I first wanted to do is replicate this vulnerability to ensure that it wasn't just in the phone I was working with, because it didn't work on the other Snapdragon chips I owned. And so I bought another phone in the Snapdragon 660 range um, and um, found that this one had all bootloader unlocking uh, functionality disabled by the manufacturer. Um, I um, found that it used a similar signature approach to the previous one. However, this signature approach was um, internal to the business and wouldn't be provided to the end user, and as such, uh, would need to be bypassed in some capacity. What I found that was by sending a slightly larger payload size to the original, 
um, on my um, Snapdragon chip, I could um, overwrite the same bootloader in the same way and patch in the bootloader unlock again, meaning this affected all Snapdragon 660 chips. Um, what I wanted to do though was push this to bypassing the user data protections. Um, so this encryption that's in place is there even if you have no password or pin available, or if you have a very weak pin, meaning that things like lock screen bypasses and things um, are the, the key. Um, it also prevents um, forensic chip off analysis as someone took the EMC, EMMC or UFS off, they wouldn't then be able to um, uh, access it via bootloader unlock or via my uh, original vulnerability. And so I want to work with that. Um, what I really want to do essentially is make a forensic attack against the phone using this and also to see if I could create something like a tethered route where I could have a phone that I use normally but if I want to have root access to it temporarily I could load an image bypass this user data protection and do whatever I wanted to with it. What I found is that there was potential for a time of check to time of use attack in the boot sequence of the chip. So um, as you can see, the source code is here because the fast boot source code is online and available and very well written, I must say as well. Um, and um, I found a command that I really want to work with this called the, um, the boot command. Now the fast boot boot command essentially um, takes an image loaded by the download command we discussed earlier and deploys Android image tem images temporarily via USB. This is to test things like custom recovery or some kind of rollbacks and that sort of thing. Um, but I did note that the verification and booting functions were very far removed from each other in this code. Um, the load image and auth function you see um, highlighted in red there um, went to some internal APIs, which I didn't have access to, and verified the signatures of the um, boot uh, image being sent, and also verified whether the bootloader unlock was unlocked or not. If it was locked or using an invalid signature, this would then um, not unlock the uh, user data uh, keys and things. Um, and then it would go through this process and boot Linux at the end. What I intended to do essentially was um, uh, use this to send, sorry, apology. Um, what I decided to do was use this to um, perform a time of check to time of use attack. Essentially I'd modify this boot upload to instead of sending just one boot image, send a four byte offset, then a signed image, which was valid and not rooted, and then an unsigned image afterwards. Essentially what I wanted to do was verify the signed image and then jump into the unsigned image so that I could root the device while still having access to user data. So the boot command doesn't function on locked bootloaders, which was absolutely fine because I could bypass that check. And what I decided to do for that is overwrite it with a, um, a plus four to move the uh, pointer from the image that I'd uploaded from the offset at the start into the signed image, meaning that as soon as the um, boot verification occurred, it would then um, verify that image was valid and the signature was valid. Um, and then I pushed this further and um, took out some unnecessary branch instructions I saw. So there's a branch and link to um, disable the menu keys and send an OK response and stop the USB pr uh, process before booting Linux. And while these are very important for sort of bringing down all the hardware before starting it up again for the main Android image, I found that even if I removed them, everything would work normally, which was very good. What I decided to do is replace these with my um, small amounts of shell code for the swap. Um, what it intended to do was um, first move the pointer back from the signed image where I put it back to the start of memory. What I then did is read the offset value in that pointer and add it to the pointer itself, pointing me straight into the unsigned image I generated. And then lastly, I pushed this new pointer into the unsigned image into this image buffer structure, which was then used as part of the booting process. Um, these essentially would allow me to swap a signed image with an unsigned image and run anything I wanted to while also having access to all the user data partitions. Um, now, of course, the key thing about this is lock screen bypasses and things, but in this uh, instance, I wanted to do it quite rapidly. And what I decided to do was use this to boot into TWRP, the uh, custom uh, recovery uh, tool. Um, by uh, deploying TWRP as the um, unsigned image that I sent alongside this data, I could um, load into it, have a full ADB root shell and go around all the data that was in there. Um, however, one could do things like modify the Android operating system or load whatever they wanted into it to get access via these forensic attacks, which is uh, quite exciting. Um, I also pushed this slightly further. Now, I've mentioned that even with pins and passwords, um, the device is encrypted, but some phones also allow you to um, encrypt your device further with passwords and pins that actually are part of the encryption process. And um, what I intended to do with this was essentially create a image where even if someone's... Um, device was encrypted in this capacity, I still loaded up an unsigned image that would stay in memory until they put in their password and give me a reverse shell. All I did was create a meterpreter image, um, chucked it into the Android image I'd unpacked, put it back together again, 
And then as soon as someone put in their password to their phone on a reboot or on the on the boot, it would give me a reverse shell. Now, this isn't a particularly viable attack, but I did think it was quite interesting. Um, so in conclusion, uh, bootloader vulnerabilities are quite common and rarely tested for, but they are quite pervasive. And the attack techniques against them are fairly simple to um, execute if you have the right mindset for how to do them. They're limited to physical attacks, which um, is obviously good because we can't get RCE and things, but they still present some significant risk and breaking off any secure boot chains is something to be uh, accounted for. Um, common chips are great targets so they, as they have a high impact and the more you can impact things, the better. And also by performing these kinds of attacks, you can then help to improve these processes and learn in a way where you don't have to do particularly complex techniques for exploitation of memory corruption vulnerabilities. Um, I also found lastly that some of the um, chips I was working with couldn't be patched in and would remain vulnerable um, continuing on. Uh, the first two NFC chips I mentioned, both were using the Cortex-M architecture. And one of the key concerns with this is because it was essentially running from flash memory for the bootloader and the main code, which would be next to each other in memory, if someone tried to uh, re uh, edit the um, bootloader in some capacity to remove my vulnerabilities, they would then potentially brick the chip if there was any power drops or if this process had any glitches, meaning that people's um, NFC chips would no longer function on their phones. Um, and so this is something that definitely needs to be accounted for when it comes to this kind of work.